Now we're going to look at the basement, the concrete around the basement. Concrete is very good at um, uh, absorbing and, and transmitting heat. And that, that's a real bad. So my, boy, my furnace is in the basement. I don't really keep my basement. There's no vents or anything, but it still stays warm because the furnace is down there working. But I've got a massive amount of heat loss along the concrete of the basement. So it's time for me also to go back and look at at least throwing up some minimal amount of insulation on the concrete walls in my basement and trying to keep some of that heat in there. That, that right there too, a lot of that is from, you know, you think about your registers in your, in your house, they're right down at the floor. What a lot of people don't do though is when you're framing that floor, that space above the concrete wall and where the floor starts in, in the floor framing usually just gets packed with insulation or shoved in or even missed. So that heat that's just right above it, that all that heat's transmitting down through, down to the concrete. Concrete's an excellent conductor, and it's just throwing the heat out of the house. So if you take time to fill in that, those cavities in the floor down there, it makes a huge improvement. People used to say, Who, you know, doesn't heat rise? Why do I have to insulate the floor? Well, that's a, a perfect example of why you want to insulate the floor. Now, when I took... This picture, I saw that the stairs were warm, and I thought, well, that, that's probably because the sun was shining on it about an hour ago. Um, so I went ahead and went around to the back of the, the house that wasn't in the sun to see if that made a difference. Um, so this is the, the, uh, this is the basement in the back of my house, and it's just as bad. <laughs> so obviously, I got some work to do. There's a great shot of a uh, window see the heat coming out of the windows and you can actually see the uh, the studs but this is the, the location where the, it's a double hung window you know where the break is no matter how good that seal is you're like you said in the early classes you're still losing some here but this is really bad up here the combination of, of escaping from the probably the top of the sash as well as the uh, frame above this is the scariest one in front of my house you see everything. There's the, the bad, the, the bad basement, the, the door, the windows, and then this window. I when I took this picture, I noticed that one white spot, and I thought, why is that window so much worse than the other ones on the second floor? When I went up there, we had uh, um, my father-in-law, my wife's father, was staying in the room, and he had the window open and he closed it, but he didn't latch it, and so there was just the fact that it wasn't latched you could pick up the difference in this window, or in this picture, and also you can see what the impact is. I mean, any, every little break in that, in that envelope can cause problems. Back at the front door, the purpose of this picture is to show you that I, when I saw that the weather stripping was so bad, I went back to take a picture, and look, you can see kind of, it really kind of centers in on this. When I pulled the door open, actually, a portion of the bottom weather stripping had worn away a little bit. And so clearly, you know, I've got to get one of those new strips on the bottom as well as uh, looking for a weather strip around the door area. The top, same thing. As far as you guys, some of that too could not necessarily be the weather stripping. When a door is installed, if you don't take the time to install it correctly, if it's slightly out of plumb, when the door shuts, it'll hit the weather stripping tight at the top but not at the bottom because the door's not in plumb and level. And that's a, a cause of it. So you can replace your weather stripping all you want, but if that door's not coming in contact with it, it's still gonna leak all the air out. Right. This is a part of my house that's just in the middle of a wall and the ceiling. Um, and it's, it's clearly got something going on. Uh, you know, there's a blue stripe here and then a blue stripe at the same location across the roof. It's about at the middle of my house, so it may be at a point where, where you were diagnosing that yeah. it could be a place where the, the studs kind of come together off and, and maybe they didn't they either jam the insulation down in there or just didn't put any in or something like that. Um, but you can see that every little thing can be caught and has a problem or has an impact. <coughs> That's that same location. This is the ceiling, and it just you can see it go across the ceiling. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures I took of uh, here at this building with the camera. <laughs> this is that area against the wall over here. We were shining the camera around. Um, 
I don't know, we could do it again. But there's this spot that we had no idea what it really was. And uh, apparently, you can, it's kind of hard to see, but up yep. I can see it. See the image? Yep. <clears throat> so there's some kind of red spot over there uh, that it turns out that there may be a, an electrical panel on the other side. But you can see that the laser, the laser point shows you exactly where I'm pointing. And so that's, that's, what I'm, that's what we're looking at. So the rest of the area, you know, it's a good six or seven degrees warmer at that one little spot. Is a picture of it? This is one of your hallways. You can see the lights. Now these lights are good. I mean, it's, uh, my house, they were bright white. Um, this is, you have the high efficiency bulbs and only one bulb of fixture. And so you can see that the heat is not all that bad coming out of there. That's a good thing. You want, you want the energy to transform the light, not heat. These little things, notice that? It's your exit sign. So even the exit signs, they're low energy, but still, if you have a big office building or a big complex that has a lot of exit signs, those, those are another thing that are on 24-7, every day, all day. You can't turn them off. It's against the code. And so the idea is that you know even if you have something that small, if you have several hundred of them and they're running all day, every day, that adds up. And so in a lot of retrofits, you find that these things haven't been touched. And you go in there, and there are these incandescent bulbs in there, and they're, they're horrible. And you replace them with LED fixtures, and you can actually see a pretty dramatic savings pretty quickly with one little element of a project. This is, a, this is visible proof of the idea of phantom load. A phantom load is something that you think is off, but is still generating power. And what, one of the things that do that the most are computers or other electronic equipment. Can you guess what type of equipment this is by looking at it? Computer. It's a printer. It's that printer. It's right around on the other side of this wall. And this, this printer is in standby mode. So if you go up to it, it looks like it's off. The light is orange. You know, sometimes lights are green when they're on and orange when they're in standby mode. So even in standby mode, you have a portion of that printer that's putting out over 100 degree heat. Wow. And that thing's just sucking up power. And so I would assume that that printer sits there on all day, every day, all year. And so that's a lot of money. You know, this picture, again, a hallway. What's more, what's more important is that is a vent. It's one of these vents. Um, this is where the fresh air in the building comes from. And it's not heated. It's, uh, it's, coming, it's being mixed a little bit with the inside air. But it's taking the outside air, and the outside air is cooling it down. And that's why you see the air coming out of that vent is well below 68 degrees. You know, the rest of the room is in the 70s. One of the things we're going to talk about is the fact we're going to build houses that are tight. So we need to bring air in so that it's healthy for us. But if you bring cold air in from the outside in the wintertime, now you're going to run your heater more to heat that heat that you're bringing in. So one of the things he was talking about, uh, perhaps you can explain a little bit more, is that whole concept of um, transferring the heat from the outgoing air to the ingoing air. Right. It's called the, the system is called an energy recovery system. And what it does is it, it, it basically runs the outside air right next to the inside air. So the outside air is uh, you know 10 degrees. The inside air is 75. And then they run through this waffle pattern so that the heat gets, a, gets shared. And so all of a sudden, the inside air jumps up about 20 or 30 degrees, and the, the air that you're expelling goes down. And so the idea is that it transfers some of that heat from the expelled air to the incoming air, and then you don't end up uh, losing a lot of money trying to heat the outside. It takes far less money to heat 50 degree air to um, 68 than it does 30 degree air to 68. And it, likewise, if you were on the outside of the building with one of these cameras and pointing it up at one of those units, you would just see this like flaming amount of heat coming off of them. This is uh, one of the doors to the classrooms. When I was when I walked up and down the hallways, I noticed that there's no there's no heating registers in most of these rooms, and it looks like that all the heating registers are inside the classrooms, and it just kind of comes out from underneath the door, and you know you guys go in and out of the classroom, and the air kind of heats up. And then there's the circulation. So there's, there's a lot of places in the building where there's not actually heat registers. But you can see that the difference between one room to the next uh, shows up underneath the doors. <clears throat>